Well, we started our season in the summer of 1970 with a, a fair degree of confidence. We, we had success as a B team, success as a freshman team, a C team in our earlier years, but you just never know because all the players turn over every year. We knew we had a tough schedule because coach Paul Martell always tried to schedule the hardest teams and we were in a tough conference at the time, the Bi-State Athletic Conference. And uh, we didn't have a very big team. We only had one player over 200 pounds on the whole team. And that was, uh, that was small even in those days. Uh, we weren't very fast. We had a couple guys who were very fast, but, but we, were, we thought we were tough and we, we had some confidence, but you just never know. So we went into the, into the uh, workouts, the two-a-days and all that stuff, just trying to do the best we, we could. We knew we, we cared for each other a lot. We liked each other a lot and we were committed. We did a lot of hard work over the summer on our own, unsupervised. But you just, you just never know. We didn't think about not having a home field. We just thought that was you know, something to think about. It really didn't bother us too much. But you don't know until you go out and, and play on the field. And the first game we played was against Cleveland, which was one of the better teams at the time in the public high league. The 1970 St. Louis University High School football team was the only team to ever win a state championship. As Joe Castellano stated earlier, the win did not come easy. They faced adversity in their hard schedule, their lack of physical gifts, and their lack of a home field. However, they cared for each other, and that would prove vital as the team came together in a world and country filled with strife and division. In the back of their minds was the Vietnam War, the generational rebellion happening at their doorsteps, and the continued fight for racial equality. In the context of the times, their win is seemingly even more impressive. Well, I, I wrote a book about the, the season and that time in our lives, and I didn't do it. Uh, I did it about 45 years after it was over, so I had had that ruminating in my thoughts during all that time. And as I researched uh, the book, as I went back over the, the, the games and did 20 or so interviews with people that were there, the coaches, the players, other constituents, others that uh, were involved in it, um, I, I thought, well, you know, this, I'm going to write the story of this championship season, but it never was to me what the book was about. We were going through a lot of difficult things as uh, 15, 16, and 17-year-olds in the late 60s and 1970. Uh, that we, we thought the country was going to erupt in civil war, as some historians have, have uh, observed. Um, there were factions, there, were, there was the Vietnam War was raging, we had race riots where thousands of people were killed in the streets. Uh, we had uh, just a lot of social unrest. There was a generational war, it seemed like. A lot of the, not me, I had a, I had a wonderful mom and dad, uh, but not everybody, not all my classmates did. They were kind of at war with, with their old man, their old man, as they used to say. So we had a lot of stuff going on. Um, and, and, uh, and as I was reading all the other things that, that happened um, during those times, the, the death of a classmate, the death of an older brother in Vietnam, all those things were weighing on us. And, uh, and, and we played football. We found refuge in that. I think that 1970s team stands out in the fact that a lot of traumatic events happened in that year for that team or in those surrounding years. And so that brotherhood was kind of uh, magnified. But what I love about it is the events, even though they were tragic, magnified um, the brotherhood of a football team that is just kind of an everyday thing. Like that's just kind of the basis of being part of a football team. And as I was researching the book, I was just going through some of the old drills that we, that we did. And I remembered the bull in the ring, which was a crazy drill. One guy would be in the middle and about five or six guys were in a circle around him. And each had a number and the, one of the assistant coaches would yell a number and that guy would come and try to knock the guy on his rear end. And then you'd have to bounce up and you don't know where the next guy's coming from. And as I'm thinking of that football drill, I thought, you know, after all these decades, that, that's a little bit what life is like. And, and so to me, the story has always been about resilience 
and those are kind of the enduring messages. Everybody gets, everybody gets knocked down. I don't care, it doesn't matter how big a bull you are, you're gonna get knocked down. And the heroism to me is, is in getting yourself back on your feet, not making excuses about it, not whining about it, but getting back up on your feet and going again. And so all the lumps that all of us have endured over the, over the course of our lives, um, that, was a, that was a good lesson to me. Some of the things that we learned on that football team in that environment were very, uh, were very useful as we made our way through life. It was unrest with the students and, uh, uh, and you know, they were wanting to be heard more and, uh, and stuff like that. A lot of the players talked about it here. And uh, then we had the civil rights movement going on uh, presidents were getting assassinated, and there was a there was a lot going on uh, in, in the United States that uh, we had to deal with back then. Well, there were two confrontations with death that I and my classmates had as 17-year-olds, and I don't want to diminish the junior class. And we had a couple of sophomores on the team also, and they were great part members of the team. Uh, but my, my class of 1971 classmates, the, the, the first confrontation was, um, as, as a community, was the death of Bob Weesey, who was St. Louis U High class of 1967, an all-star football, uh, baseball player and wrestler, uh, top-notch guy, and he had uh, enlisted in the Marines in Vietnam and was killed on a kind of a mission of mercy run to bring uh, medical supplies. And, his, and the copter went down in a mountain in Vietnam and all lives were lost. His younger brother was Mike Weesey, my classmate, uh, class of 71. And we were here at the school when uh, word came out and Mike was pulled out of his, out of his class to, to be told his brother Bob was killed in Vietnam. Um, and of course that shook Mike to his foundation. Mike de devoted the next season to him. Mike had a season well beyond his, what I'd like to say, skinny, bony, 170 pounds of, of determination. He was all Metro and all state defensive end. He was an offensive receiver and he, he had the most inspired season you can ever imagine. But it affected all of us because the Vietnam War all of a sudden became very personal. Then in August, uh, we had uh, a lot of excitement for the coming for our senior year. And we had four student council officers, and, the, and Ed Hawk was the, the uh, vice president elect of the student council. And, and we got word that uh, there was a, a botched robbery attempt on August 1st, and Ed was shot and, um, and, uh, and was in the hospital. And we thought he was going to recover, so we came together and prayed hard. We gathered. Um, and Ed took a turn for the worse, he didn't make it, and he died on August 14th, the night before the, the football practice is open. And that was, that was a lot for 17-year-olds to uh, cope with. And, uh, and we came together as a faith community. We had mass, we prayed hard, we, 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 we leaned into each other hard. Some guys took it in different ways, some guys were open and, and, and uh, emotional about it. Others took a while to process, but we all dealt with it. And we devoted our season to Ed. And, uh, and it, it hit us. I, for me personally, it, it shook my faith. It shook my faith. I said, I mean, what's the point? Uh, a young man could have this random act of violence befall him and and his life snatched away. And I went to see the, the counsel of uh, Father Ed O'Brien, who was a senior counselor and a, and a legendary um, uh, philosophy and religion teacher here. And I had a conference with him, and I just said that to him. I said, Obi, I, you know, I'm really <laughs> not feeling it right now. I mean, what's the point of going on? And, uh, and he just said, well, you can feel that way if you want. He, he just... He didn't belittle me, he didn't lecture me. He just, he just said, you know, uh, that's what Jesus Christ is here to do. He's, these things happen and he's there, he's a refuge to you. And 
I, I, it was the way he made me feel, I think. Walking out of that room, I just felt like, okay, now I think I could, with this faith as a foundation, I think I could handle anything. And, uh, and I have to tell you, looking back over 50 years, that and it, it, Obi wasn't the only one. There was a whole faith community here, the Jesuits uh, here at St. Louis U High, but, but each other. We, we, uh, so we, we said the rosary on the, way to, on the bus on the way to every one of our away games. We, we had uh, mass. Uh, before or after games, right up in this chapel, I'm talking to you, and right across there, the North American Martyrs Chapel, um, and and we and we thought about it a lot, we reflected on it a lot, and and so as you look back over life, we were playing a game. It was a football game. It was a it was it wasn't silly. It was an important endeavor. It pulled us together. It gave us something to focus on, and and to stay away from our grief, to stay away from thoughts of revenge or any of that kind of stuff. We just kind of said, let's guys, let's do this together. And we did, and, and, and we felt Ed's presence with us through the season. We felt God's presence with us. We didn't pray to have him let us win. We never did that. We just said, we just said you know, let us understand the meaning of, of this game, of this life, of this brotherhood. And, uh, and, I, and it's a lesson that I've been able to take with me my whole life. It's given me unbelievable strength through, through all the things. I, nobody goes through life without having some major blows. Those, you know, those moments of the test your resilience, like bull in the ring. Nobody gets off without those. But it gave you it gave you a way to bounce back. Nobody really talked about it back then. It was, it, I, I guess we had a distraction, which was the start of the football season, and. And I know I I had uh, a, lo a lot of thoughts about it, but I, I used it to in the way I played. So, well, Mike Weezy uh, was our defensive end, and he had just lost his brother in Vietnam, and I I think that really spurred him on because he he was tremendous. He was a great football player and a good teammate. So. Uh, in that respect, uh, that spurred him on. I think everybody on our team had something to play for together. And uh, so use it that way to uh, Im improve our cohesion as a group. On the football side of things, the team geared up for a tough season with Coach Paul Martell and Evie Dunn. At this point, the state championship was far off in their minds. And while they were aware of their disadvantages, they also knew that with these two men at the helm, they would have the guidance necessary to have a great season. Well, we knew we had a good coach, and we had uh, in Paul Martel. He had a success rate. He he had very good teams before the playoffs ever started in uh, in 1968. He'd been around for a while, and of course, Ebby Dunn was his only assistant coach, which was pretty unusual. There are a lot of coaches as you see teams today, there was just those two men and they had some volunteers and they had a couple of Jesuit scholastics that would help out. But mostly it was those two coaches and we knew that uh, he, that he was f a formidable coach, but he was a most intimidating individual. And, and as tough as we thought we were, as macho as we thought we were as young teenagers, as indestructible as we thought we were, this man who, uh, at the time was just in his early 40s. Uh, he had this kind of a square, tough steel jaw. He had a very serious demeanor. Um, it, it, half of us were afraid of him. The other half uh, didn't want to be around him, but, but we respected him and we did what he expected. We also knew he was kind of a football mad genius. Uh, with the plays that he drew up and diagrammed and, and, the, and the schemes that he would put in. He, he took advantage of our, of our talent, what we were good at, and designed offense and defense to, to match that up. And, uh, but you had to put up with his idiosyncrasies, and one of them was, was his uh, unbelievable attention to detail. And I, in the book, I, it was a good place to start because I do recall uh, it was on Thanksgiving Day, uh, uh, Thursday, in 1970, two days before our state championship game in Columbia, and uh, and we had had a, a you know, not a 
our most rigorous practices. We just, you know, fine tuning and everything else. But we're on the the old uh, grassless lower field, which which old time guys will remember. Um, and it was cold and it was windy. And he was talking in excruciating detail about the plans for our upcoming trip to Columbia, where we would play Kansas City Center High School for the state championship. And we were all standing around, kind of our teeth were chattering and our hands were in our, our pants, were blowing, and, and he's going into detail about, well, we're gonna arrive there and uh, we're gonna check into the hotel in the morning, it'll be a bacon and egg situation, which was an odd way to say we're gonna have breakfast. Um, and a couple of us, we, you know, we knew, uh, we, we, we just thought that was funny and peculiar and uh, as, as kind of an inside joke. Um, but we respected him. And, and with all that planning, he had us prepared. He had us, he had us uh, excruciatingly uh, prepared in, in, in fine detail. Before his death, Coach Paul Martel sat down with Castellano to discuss his career for Castellano's book, Bull in the Ring, about the football championship. Castellano entrusted us with some of the recordings from this interview. Martel's philosophy of scheduling the hardest opponents was famous, or perhaps infamous, among slew high players. Here's what Coach Martel had to say about it. You always felt, if you're going to beat somebody, beat somebody that's good. And then when the playoffs came along, it was doubly important that you play these teams because if you can't beat them, you're not going to get into the playoffs anyway. So you get that experience of playing good ball clubs. There's no sense in playing weak sisters and end up getting nothing. The first game is always the real test. The team never knows how successful they will be until they are actually fighting the battle on the gridiron. The first test for them was Cleveland, the defending champions of the public high league, the collection of public high schools within the St. Louis city limits. The school was known for the tough athletes that it produced and they seemed poised for a win against what they must have perceived as the boys of privilege, St. Louis U High. At that point, the starting quarterback role had been solidified down to seniors Doug McDonald and Dan Kalachi. According to Castellano and Bull in the Ring, Kalachi worked the edges while McDonald played the center stripes. And while the offense impressed, the slew defense is what stole the show. Defensive end Mike Weesey was seemingly unblockable as he went on to be named Defensive Player of the Week by the Post Dispatch. In an interview to the St. Louis Post Dispatch, head coach Paul Martel said, We're already running 75 options on defense. Our kids react well, and as long as they can cover their responsibilities, we could have a heck of a year with this defense of ours. I'll admit it, I'm really pleased. I mean, really. Well, the paper was saying, they were saying we were a good team. And uh, uh, in, until you get on the field and you actually get against an opponent, you don't, you don't know what you got. So how do kids react to pressure? You now, all, all of those kind of things. Or their memory about plays and all that stuff. And uh, Cleveland was a good test. And uh, uh, was a, it was a good start to sort of putting everything that we went through in training camp uh, aside. Next up on the St. Louis U High football team's radar were the McClure Comets, the winner of the first two official state championships in 1968 and 1969. Despite this tough opposition, they went to the third quarter in a scoreless tie. This tie was broken first by the Billikens with a touchdown pass to senior Errol Patterson. However, star McClure quarterback Steve Pizarkowitz, who would later go on to be a first-round pick by the St. Louis Cardinals football team, rallied his team to two touchdown drives to make the final score 14-6, a loss for the St. Louis U High Junior Billikens. Well, resilience and picking yourself back up in that season, uh, the best uh, 
uh, thought that comes to mind was the second game of the season. I mentioned we, we beat Cleveland 21 nothing, and now we're full of ourselves, and we play McClure. Uh, you have to keep in mind, in 1970, that was only the third year that there was a formal playoff for a state champion. McClure High and Ferguson had won the first two, and so we're playing McClure at, uh, up in North County, and we think, well, we can beat these guys, and they beat us. They beat us 14 to six. They had a quarterback named Steve Mazarkowitz who ended up having an All-American career at the University of Missouri and then he was the first round draft choice of the football Cardinals. He was pretty good, uh, obviously, and he, and he threw two touchdown passes and we lost 14 to six and we thought, well, our season's over. We're, we're one and one. We have no chance now to win the state championship. All we can do is go one game at a time and we kind of rededicated ourselves to say, Let's not let that happen again. Let's, let's everybody do everything he can on every play. And, and then we, we went through that first third of the season and, and we, we righted ourselves. We played some pretty good games. And toward the end, we had uh, a series of, uh, I think our last five games, we won, we won by a total average of about uh, less than five points. So every one was a close game. We came on, out on top in every game. Uh, I can't, I, can't I, I have to be honest and say we felt we were a little bit lucky in some of those games. But as you look at champions in every sport over every era, the champions, for the most part, have a little bit of luck involved, and we certainly did. In terms of having a, uh, a football sense, I had a better f football sense than a lot of the guys on the field. So uh, that really helped me. And like I said, I led by example. So, uh, you know, I, I remember playing against McClure. Uh, they double teamed me the whole night. I mean, I was, my face was in the dirt the whole night. And uh, and the, the rest of the team, like I said, picks you up, you know. So I just had to fight the double team and rely on the other people around me to uh, make the plays. So. Yeah, that was a big test because they were the public high champions from the year before. So, and that was a tough league. You know, you're talking back then, it's not now, but back then, Beaumont, Soldan, uh, McKinley, they were Southwest, they were always tough schools. So, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a, a, a big game for us to start the season out. The next team they faced was Columbia Hickman who were the runners-up in the 1969 campaign to McClure, the team that had just beaten SLU. Columbia Hickman had gone on to crush their first two opponents. The 25-13 and 13 victory, though, showed the type of defense that SLU had. It started badly. They fumbled on the opening kickoff, and McClure recovered 20 yards from the end zone. However, the defensive line made a goal-line stand, led by Mike Weesey and linebacker Kevin O'Toole. After an interception from Sioux's quarterback Doug McDonald, though, the team rallied for another crucial stop on third and ten. Mike Weesey just barely missed a sack, but forced Columbia Hickman quarterback Lou Onofrio to scramble left, right into a tackle by Tom O'Shagnessy. They then stopped a punt fake to recover the ball for their offense, who finally found their footing on their way to the victory. But then Columbia Hickman was a different story because they were ranked... I think they were ranked third at the time and you know we had to make the trip up there in the bus and uh so that was a tough game but uh it it i think it really showed what kind of team we had that i think that was a a good game to really set up what was going to take place the rest of the year i never i never put any faith in in rankings uh you could be the best team in the world because you make one mistake, you lose a game, and you drop 10 spots or whatever. You know, that's just, that's just stupid. I, I think it's, it, it's, it's hard for me to rank teams, and I really didn't look at those, and, and it's, it's because of the way I said before, if you take care of the little things, it'll work out in the end. So Against Cahokia, Errol Patterson led the charge with two interceptions on defense and two touchdown receptions on offense, one from senior Doug McDonald and one from Dan Kalachi, who were splitting time at quarterback.
they won 30 to nothing. Then they found themselves against a Smet, who many refer to as Slew West for their distinction as being the second Jesuit school founded and west of the old, much older Slew High. They had five interceptions, and Bill Ziegler stole the show with a 70-yard touchdown run. They won the game 27-7. Augustine saw Dan Kalachi solidify his role as the team's starter for the rest of the season as he completed 5-7 of seven for 172 yards. They won 50 to nothing, led by Errol Patterson's 79-yard touchdown. By this time, they had reached the rank the fourth on the prep top 10 ranking from the post-dispatch. Altoff ran well against Slew's commanding defense, however, and the Junior Bills made four, that's right, four goal line stands, rejecting them the touchdowns. Tim Kellett played exceptionally well as offensive tackle and as he subbed in for the injured defensive tackle, Fred Douse. Announcer Dave Bullen suggested that Kellen might have made 70-75% to 75 or even more of the tackles that night. Their win against Altoff, combined with losses by both CBC and Riverview Gardens, moved SLU up to the third-ranked team in the state. That was, that, that was a great game. I remember three goal line stands that we had in, inside the, I want to say, the inside the six-yard line. And, uh, you know, the defense won that game. I mean, it, it, it was amazing how, that we stopped them all three times down, down inside the six. The four goal line stands against Altoff showcased the exceptional defense that SLU had. The linebackers were the stars of the show, along with great defensive ends. They showcased their toughness through blitzing a lot. And while their toughness was a key aspect of their defense, perhaps the post, their most notable part was their two huddles defense, where they would line up in two separate huddles, call two separate schemes, and throw off the offense by their wonking-looking defense, which proved effective. Well, I'll tell you what, we weren't very big. <laughs> We had one guy over uh, 200 pounds, Fred, with 215. So we had to rely on our quickness as a defense. Uh, on defense, though, I was an inside linebacker, and we had a great core of linebackers. Our outside linebackers were Bill Ziegler and Tom Shack, two of the finest athletes anywhere and two of our best players. The inside linebackers, uh, we, we did a rotation with a few of us. But he put in something uh, that we just loved. It was a two-huddle defense. There were two huddles on the, on the defensive side. And, it you know, whatever one side called, they didn't know what the other side was calling. One might call a 50 defense. The other one might call a 60 defense. And according to Paul, everything was covered. And we blitzed a lot, too. So uh, I think his innovation really kept teams on uh, at a disadvantage because their blocking schemes weren't the, weren't the same on either side of the line it was hard to recognize and uh, it, it was it was unusual very unusual and uh, but was very effective next was the big rival CBC the two teams came together for the 44th time the game as was customary at the time was held in Bush Stadium in front of thousands of cheering fans who came to watch the rivalry unfold. In an act of class, the CBC Student Council dedicated the game to Ed Hawk inside the bulletin, showing the respect that even these rivals had for each other. Before the game, Martell told reporters that they faced an uphill battle, especially as the undersized team. They went scoreless in the first, but struck quickly in the second as Tim Leahy returned a punt to the 34-yard line. Kalachi threw a pass to Mike Weesey next, who caught it at the 37, but was able to maneuver the ball to the 50. Then, only one more pass was needed, and this time it was to Leahy, who was at the 30, and was able to sprint to the end zone. A Tim Gibbons extra point brought the game to 7-0. Despite more back and forth, the half ended with Slew up 7-0. After Weesey twisted his ankle, his time on offense was done for the night leaving Jim Dore, who primarily saw action on special teams. CBC rallied with two touchdowns. However, they missed two field goal opportunities and an extra point on one of their touchdowns, 
The score was now 13 to 7. After the last field goal had been missed, Kalachi led his team on a desperate drive. After the first down was dropped, Tim Dorr indicated to assistant coach Ebby Dunn that he was open. And for second and ten, Dunn called the play. The ball was coming for the backup receiver, Jim Dorr. He sprinted about 10 or 12 yards, hesitated to throw the defenders off, and sprinted back up the field. Kalachi dropped back a little deeper than normal and let out the long pass. Dorr, who was just inches taller than his defender, was able to catch the ball, albeit on his helmet. He re-secured the ball with his two hands and sprinted to complete the spectacular 80-yard play. The Junior Bills would go on uh, to win after Tim Gibbons, the young sophomore, jotted onto the field and kicked the game-winning field goal. By a score of 13-14, to 14, the Junior Bills just barely edged out their rival CBC. So when I came down, uh, one of the first parents that I met had asked me, have you sold your house yet in Kansas City? And I said, no. And she said, well, don't sell it until after the CBC game. <laughs> uh. So we played CBC and we won big and she had a little party and invited the coaches after the game. And the first thing she said to me, okay, you can sell your house now. The CBC game was quite a special memory, and I, uh, we hadn't done well against our classmates from CBC as freshmen, as, as sophomores, uh, and so um, we, we knew they were good. My classmates, my teammates won't like me saying this, but I think they're probably better than us. <laughs> um, and so we, we had played there as juniors, and, and a couple of the guys on the team were sophomores, they played there. They started that series in 1966 when I was in eighth grade. That, you talk, that was the, uh, there were 30,000 people in the stadium that year. St. Louis U High was ranked number one and CBC was ranked number two. And CBC uh, smashed the junior Billikens that, that Sunday afternoon. But that made it quite an impact on me. I don't, I don't think there have been that many people at a football, high school football game in the state of Missouri since. Uh, it was the year the stadium opened and, and uh, uh, SLU and CBC had put that game together and played there for several years. But now it was our turn. Now it was our turn to go on to that, um, to that artificial turf, which I remember being about as soft as a concrete driveway. <laughs> it wasn't comfortable, which is probably okay. Um, and we played them uh, in front of uh, 16 or 18,000 fans, um, and it was a big deal. We were both pretty good. It was for the conference championship, the Bi-State Conference Championship. We got off to a lead. We felt pretty good about that. Then they came back and scored um, twice, and they took a 13-7 to lead, and the clock was ticking, and we were kind of getting backed up, and we were on our own 20. We didn't have too many... We didn't know how many series we'd have left, and I think it was uh, it was late, getting late in the game. And Danny Kalachi, the late Danny Kalachi, we miss him. Uh, he was our quarterback, a free spirit. He he rolled, he faded back, and uh, I remember the play distinctly because I was on my rear end because I got overrun by a, one or two CBC guys. And Dan launched this ball into the air, um, and and. Uh, Jim Dorr was a junior who was in the game only because Mike Weesey and, and Errol Patterson, our star wide receiver, had been injured. And Jim Dorr tells a great, describes it in detail in the book I wrote about uh, catching this ball. He was very nervous, but he got a, he got a, a step or two on his CBC defender and uh, the ball just, he caught it against his helmet and never broke stride and said, I just never, I thought it was going to pop a hamstring. I, I never ran as fast as I could. Completed an 80-yard touchdown pass. We kicked the extra point. Tim Gibbons kicked the extra point. Tim, who went on to a star career at the University of Missouri as a kicker. Uh, Tim, who, had, who uh, uh, a couple weeks later kicked a 40-yard field goal to win the semifinal state game. He made both of his points after touchdown. And the, the poor CBC kicker, who was a junior, who was kind of brought up to the varsity, uh, missed one. And so we won 14 to 13. And, and I have to tell you, you know, as close as that game was, as serendipitous as that winning touchdown was, as, 
Um, you know, every t we look back and that result never changes. <laughs> and we have, you know, got good friends at CBC. They, we had a great rivalry. Uh, uh, Billy Donegan was, a, was the guy who, who gave up, who got beat. He was an all-city or all-conference, uh, maybe all-metro defensive back. He got beat on that touchdown. But he said, I think maybe you guys, maybe Eddie Hawk was looking over you guys that day. And it looked, certainly looked like it was meant to be. Well, so we, we won that game, and that clinched the Bi-State Conference. And then the next, the reward was to play Riverview Gardens, which had been number one in the area before that. And it was one of the, the like McClure, these tough North County teams. They were full of the sons of these people that worked at the car plants and, and McDonnell Douglas at the time, and, and just a formidable, the suburb, suburban North Conference. So now we're playing Riverview Gardens at their place. And, uh, and they were tough. Uh, my teammates and classmates won't like this, but I think they were better than us too. <laughs> so we beat them uh, at their place on a Friday night, the next Friday night after the CBC game, 15 to seven, I think was it. Uh, we won the game by throwing, I think. And we, I don't, the running game was okay, but uh, we passed a lot more during that game. So th that part of our game, I think, helped win uh it was it was a battle you know we we hated cbc you know the running of the bills you know before we'd run up to cbc up on here off of clayton you know when they were there and uh, uh it was a, a bit of rivalry and uh, uh it was it felt really good to beat them i mean we won on a 80 yard pass play to again an underclassman jim door and uh uh, and then we had the underclassman, sophomore Tim Gibbons, kick extra points. You know, back in high school in those days, field goals, nobody thought of field goals, you know. Well, when we had Gibbons, we thought of field goals. He kicked quite a few of them. And extra points were very important. You saw some of the games, 6 nothing, missed an extra point. 14-13, uh, 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 CBC misses an extra point. So... Having a good kicker that could put the ball through the uprights was a, a big plus. And uh, that was Tim Gibbons. So uh, uh, CBC, though, you know, playing in front of 18,000 people, too. I mean, that's, that's unheard of. For the final game of the season, they faced Riverview Gardens. The first touchdown was scored after Kalachi miraculously avoided sack after sack from the giant... Riverview Gardens lineman. He eventually got a break, sprinted up the sidelines, and scored a touchdown. They countered that in the second quarter, and for the majority of the third, they went back and forth, remaining at 7-7. Seven to seven. Late in the third quarter, Paul Martell gave his star running back Bill Ziegler the ball. Ziegler would pound through in 10 rushing plays to score a touchdown that would put them at 13-7 to after Gibbons missed an extra point. The defense held, and the safety gave the team a 15-7 to lead, which would eventually turn into their victory. They ended the season 9-1, and and they had hopes to go even further, to state, and they knew at this point that it was definitely a possibility but all they could do was wait. And now we thought, well, I wonder if that's going to get us in the playoffs. At the time, there was a real quirky point system that, that uh, took into account your, the, your wins, your, your wins, your ties, your losses, and then again, against how good your opponents were, what were their records. And so it was really kind of hard. There was an ongoing calculation and a progression as you went through the, through the season. And uh, after the last game, we, they said you qualified for the playoffs. There were only four, four teams at the time that qualified for a, a semifinal game, and then a, the winners went on to the championship. And by a kind of quirk of the system, we qualified against Riverview Gardens to play them again the, the following Saturday. And we played that game at Francis Field at Washington University. And uh, we thought, man, we, I think we were lucky to escape them. And I think they thought that. So they're thinking, well, now we'll really have a chance to get them when it counts. And they came down and marched down on us in the, the, the first possession they had, and they just were kind of blowing past us and scored a touchdown. And so now they're up 7 nothing. And I thought, 
I, I think maybe our luck has run out, fellas. <laughs> But we, we, we got a hold of ourselves. We got a hold of ourselves and we, and we righted the ship and we scored a game tying touchdown. And then we had a chance uh, kind of late in the game and, and, and Riverview Gardens had the ball deep in their territory on fourth down and they went for it, which you would never do, you'd punt, but they, they were stopping us. They, they felt, well, they, you know, we'll just have our defense stop and we'll get the ball back. Maybe we make a first down. Well, they didn't, so we took over on downs, and we advanced the ball a little bit, and now, uh, now we're stuck at, at fourth down and long. And coach says, tells the sophomore, who was <laughs> Tim Gibbons, who was the quarterback on the sophomore team, and he had started, he didn't even start the year kicking for us, and he says, go on in there and try that field goal. And it was kind of windy, <laughs> and Gibbons goes in there, and 40-yard field goal, nobody was kicking 40-yard field goals back then. And he kicks this thing, and, and there's a great shot on the game films. It's of the referee kind of looking and looking and running, and all of a sudden he puts his hands up for a successful field goal, and, and, uh, and we go up 10 to 7 and hold them and win that game and qualify for the state championship. So we thought, you know, there is something, something maybe supernatural going on here. Maybe we're, we are a team of destiny. And, of course, we always believed in ourselves, and we, we were always going to do the best we could do. We thought this is this is really special, and then of course we had one more game to play. They were here, the championship, a place they could have never imagined just mere weeks ago. Now, however, they faced Kansas City Center, a very huge team that ran aggressive and a professional wishbone offense. They paraded down the field to score on their first drive after winning the coin toss and choosing offense. This left the Junior Billikens down seven to nothing. However, it took them just 10 seconds to tie the game after senior Errol Patterson returned a kickoff for a touchdown and after a successful point after. At halftime, they led 14 to seven after a Ziegler touchdown. The aggressive Kansas City center team, though not to be outdone, responded with another touchdown, but missed the field goal, meaning it was still a Junior Billiken lead by one point. Ziegler, not to be outdone, drove in another touchdown. It was 21 to 13. At this point, they saw the end in sight. They saw that they might be able to beat this Goliath of a team, that they might be state champions. Another Ziegler touchdown is all it would take to seal the score at 28 to 13. And as the clock ticked down and as it came closer to zero, the reality set in. The Junior Billikens would be state champions. The first state champions in St. Louis University High School history. Yeah, I, I, they didn't, there weren't gambling lines and there weren't really picks. And so I don't know that we thought of ourselves as under, we felt it, that we were lucky. We felt that we had something special. We thought that we were good. We knew we had a couple of really good players and we had a coach that was gonna prepare us. So. But we knew this, we didn't know much about the team. I, I tell the story in the book, I, I didn't know this until many years later. You know, you can understand why coaches were reluctant to exchange films with Paul Martell, because I mean, he could, watch, he could look at a play and see what all 11 of us did wrong and, and yell at us. He, he just had this unbelievable scope. And, he, and he, so he would break a film down and, and he would, you give him a film and, and the other coach a film, and, and Coach Martell was going to get a lot of advantage out of that. So I think maybe the, the Kansas City Center coach figured that out, and he refused to get, share the films with us. So Coach was kind of having to call up other pl coaches that he knew that played him and trying to get a little scouting report on, on how, they, how they played. And what he told me, he said, looks like they, they don't really, they don't really uh, uh, pass very much. Uh, they, they run a lot, good two runners, I think each had like a thousand yards. And so we were preparing for the run. And of course, we, we, we go into this game and, and they, uh, they're, they're big, they're fast. The game was at Furrow Field down at University of Missouri on a Saturday afternoon, a brisk, clear day, it was a beautiful day. And uh, we thought, wow. These guys are big and good. They marched down on us, and I think they sc scored first. And I thought, we're, we're going to be in for it here. I remember uh, Tim Rogers was, was uh, the guy who did our pep rallies, a classmate. He didn't play football, but he told me many years later, he's in the stands, and 
he sees, he sees this team come out running the wishbone offense, which was a power offense. He just thought we were kind of in over our heads. And so that, that we, we thought, okay, we, we got ourselves a game here. Of course, we, we found a way to, to come through. I don't want to say lucky, but it was sort of lucky that it, it happened at that time and so forth. But uh, we knew, knew they were a tough team. We knew we were a tough team. And uh, we had to find out on the field who was going to be you know, a champion. So. They never thought they would be the only state championship team. However, fate had different plans. In the 50 years since, no other junior build team has ever been able to replicate the winning season that the undersized underdogs of the 1970 team did. They provide a lesson to all of us, especially when one juxtaposes their crazy reality to our crazy COVID world. They are a lesson that our passions here in our great bubble of SLU can help us rise above adversity and come out better for it. I'll tell you one thing that I thought that we surely didn't do a good job on pass defense because their quarterback, who hadn't thrown the ball that much, ended up with over 200 yards passing. And uh, a lot of it pretty much went to their end. Yeah, so, Beckett, yeah. So we're down to the point, you know, that we had a hard time stopping the passing game. I think the crucial play of the game was just before halftime when we stopped them short of the goal line. I think Sheck made a two in a row. Made a hell of a play on on those uh, last two plays and stopped their fullback, who was one of their top runners. And I thought that in itself, when it was all over with, that was the turning point of the ball game. I'd almost have to look at the game as part luck also because hey how many times did we run a kickoff back? <laughs> so here uh, Earl Patterson runs one back and then uh, Ziegler runs one back and then here comes Ziegler and runs another 85 yard run off from scrimmage. So there again, I mean, there had to be some fortune of good luck involved there because we really didn't spend that much time on special teams. We should have probably spent a lot more, you know, in our practice sessions. But you get down to the point, you know, when we're over at Forest Park, You know, and by the time guys get out of school and you do all the taping and everything and get them over at Forest Park, we really don't have that much practice time because we were always told get out of the uh, uh, gymnasium, the, the school, by 6 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. So when you get right down to it, we couldn't even have a two-hour practice session. <laughs> Well, let's see, we've lost three players. Uh, well, not three players, Ed Hawk wasn't a player, but that was very traumatic for everybody. Uh, we lost Bob Tebow, which was one of our other captains not, not too long ago. And we uh, lost Del, uh, uh, Pat Bannister, Del Patterson, uh, uh, <laughs> Bannister, excuse me. Uh, I always called him Pat, and all, all his good friends called him Dell, and I couldn't remember. I think it was because his dad's middle name was Dell or something. But uh, yeah, that that's you know it it they were you know true friends. I you know I don't know how you guys get along in here with people, but uh, you had you had one or two that maybe were oddballs, you know. But uh, more, everybody had a common goal, and it's 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 very hard to get there. Uh, uh, there are some teams that maybe have been there two or three times, but 
you know, over a span of 50 years, that, that's really not that many. And uh, it, it's just tough to get there. And that accomplish, accomplishment uh, was very big for, for our group. And uh, I think uh, that's a reason we s still see each other, is we can relive not so much the games, you know, the stuff that went on around the games, in practice, off the field, in classrooms. Like I said, it was a great time, and I, I love getting together with those guys, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to plan a good 50-year reunion. And the one thing that I always thought, you know, was I close enough to the ball players, and if anything were to be said, I loved every one of them because they were there for a purpose and they did the best thing they could do. And that's all I could ever ask out of a person. But I was not one, you know, that would go around and hug everybody <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, little, little be it known, you know, that if there were 600 guys that played football during my tenure, I could always say, yes, I loved 600 guys that played for me.